morning. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. For the last two weeks, we have been on a series called Growing Up Spiritually. And we're talking about your spiritual growth and development. Your spiritual growth and development is very important because God cannot anoint a sinful, carnal, flesh um, person, a person who's yielding to the sinful, carnal nature. Even many Christians are not developed spiritually. But God has work for you to do, and God has good works prepared for you, and God wants to be able to anoint you. And you may think, well, how can I be anointed? I'm not a preacher. Anointing is not just for the preachers. Anointing is for every Christian to do what they are called to do with a supernatural power of God on them to do it. You can be an anointed mother. You can be an anointed father. You can be an anointed dentist or anointed school teacher or an anointed um, a doctor or or anything else that is your profession. God can give you an anointing to do it, an anointed plumber or electrician to have a God given power to do everything better with supernatural empowerment. And so God wants to put an anointing on your life, but God cannot anoint carnal Christians sinful nature, those that yield to the sinful nature, walk in the flesh. They need, every single Christian needs to grow up spiritually and develop spiritually so that, for one thing, they can receive greater anointing and power from God in their lives. You need it in your life. Don't you know that? I'm sure you do. So many Christians say, I need more power. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You do need more power. And it's available. And one of the things that gives you power is the anointing. But the anointing does not come on carnal Christians but only on those who have crucified the sinful nature or are practicing this. So anyway, let's go back to our study where we've been studying and we have been talking about three basic stages of spiritual growth. The first stage was babies. The second stage was the child youth stage, which is the educational stage, the development stage, the training stage. And we've talked about characteristics of people in these stages. And you can be physically, physically an adult, but still be spiritually a baby or spiritually a child or a youth. So being a physical adult, and you may have been, as we've said before, spiritual maturity is not automatic with the pass of time, passage of time. Time does not make you more mature. And so there are Christians who have been Christians for 10, 20, 30, 40, or even 50 years who are still babies or children spiritually, but they're 50, 60, 70 years in the body. And so you can be an old person and still be a spiritual baby or child. You need to grow up. You need to develop yourself spiritually. So we're looking at the child youth stage, which is the educational development stage. We taught, we said last week that a child thinks like a child, a child talks like a child, a child acts like a child. Then we also talked last week about um, rebellion and ch- uh, youths, especially, but children and youths can have a spirit of rebellion Well, even among Christians, there are Christians who have a spirit of rebellion against the church, against church leadership, and even against God. And so there needs to be a practice of submission 
to godly church authority. Now, last week I explained there's a difference between ungodly, abusive leadership, which you don't want, and you get as far away from it as you can. If you see any church leadership that is controlling and manipulating its people, then get away from it. And in the same way, church members try to control their pastor. That's wrong. But we're not talking about misuse and abuse of authority. We're talking about the godly use of God-ordained authority. God established authority in the church. God established leadership. God established ranks. Why? Because authority brings order. Order brings peace, safety, and security. There is order in the home, in the family. There is order in the church. There is order in the nation. And we need to learn to submit to authorities for that safety, protection, and correction. And therefore, also, we talked about correction. Humility receives correction. Pride despises correction. But godly authority needs to have the right to correct and rebuke. It is part of training. It is part of training. So then we also saw that a child needs to be taught the wisdom of God, taught the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the word of God. And I read several scriptures to you in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, about taking the commandments and putting them in your heart and teaching them to your children. Also, we read Deuteronomy 11, 18 to 21, fixing God's word in your heart and mind and teaching them to your children. And God says, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. I'm going to come back to that later. And then we saw that a child needs to be trained. Now, training is different than teaching. Teaching is instruction. Teaching is giving of knowledge and information and wisdom. Training is practice and exercise. Practicing the knowledge, putting it into practice and exercising. And the word training means to subject to discipline for the purpose of Forming character, behavior, and performance. Forming character, behavior, and performance. It means literally to exercise, practice, and drill. To exercise, practice, and drill. And it's to make capable and proficient and skillful by instruction and practice. To make capable, proficient, and skillful. So we talked about the military. You go in the military, you go to boot camp, and you get drilled. Drilling is a practice of certain exercises. If you're learning an instrument, musical instrument, the tuba, the trumpet, whatever, piano, you practice and you do drills and exercises to become skillful and proficient. If you are an athlete, especially if you're training for games and competition, then you go into very strict exercising, practicing, and drilling to become skillful and proficient. So we said in in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Well, a lot of Christians have misinterpreted that training as simply take your child to church on Sunday morning and make him go to Sunday school. Sunday school one morning a week is not training. That is why many, many, many children who went to Sunday school grow up and turn away from God when they become adults. If all they got was Sunday morning, Sunday school, and nothing at home, that is the reason why many 
have turned away. And the parents are saying, hey, I brought my child to Sunday school. That's what the Bible says. Train a child in the way he should go. And he, when he's old, he'll not turn from it. That's not training. Training is seven days a week, 24 hours a day, drilling and practicing and exercising. So drilling your children in spiritual exercises at home, seven days a week. Morning till night, when they get up in the morning, when they go to bed at night, various exercises. Sometime during the day, morning or night, teach them to read the Bible. Teach them to pray. And teach them, we're we're going back to Deuteronomy 6 verse, verse 7 and Deuteronomy 11 verse 19 They say, teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. That means everything you do in life. When you eat bread, you teach your child. Jesus said in John chapter six, I am the bread of life and teach them about Jesus being the bread of life. Or Jesus said, In Matthew 4, during the temptation by Satan, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So teach your children, when you eat bread, use the bread as an example to teach them a spiritual lesson. Talk about going from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. When they drink milk, you teach them now spiritually, the word of God is milk. For a baby Christian, but the word of God becomes strong meat according to Hebrews chapter five, Hebrews chapter five, it's strong meat for the mature. So as you eat this beef steak, consider it like the word of God. When you read the Bible and you get more revelation and understanding, it becomes strong meat. Or when you look at the birds flying through the air, remind your child of Matthew chapter six, how God feeds the birds and he'll care for his, his children and provide for their needs. You know, everything in life, when you do the traffic and you see the broad way and the narrow way, tell them that Jesus said, wide is the way to destruction and many go there, but narrow is the path to life and few find it. So you can be walking down the road and telling them about the wide path to destruction or the narrow path to life. Use the everyday things around you to teach your children morning till night and then drill them in spiritual exercises of reading the Bible and praying, speaking their faith, believing to receive. Remember, teach them the law of faith. Teach them the law of sowing and reaping. Sow a seed, believe God, and get your harvest. Do you want a new toy? Well, sow a seed for that toy and believe God for the harvest. Well, not only do children need this, but so do you, an adult. Adults need the same discipline practice and there's a lot of christians that are carnal christians because they only go to church on sunday morning and they do no other spiritual exercises monday through saturday and they live according to the flesh and they live to please the flesh and the de- gratify the desires of the flesh yield to the to the attitudes and temptations of the flesh Well, you also need to be practicing and drilling morning till night, seven days a week. You read your Bible. You study scripture. Memorize scripture. Keep it in your mouth. Keep it in your heart. Speak it. You memorize one or two scriptures. If you haven't done this before, then memorize one every week. Teach your children to memorize one scripture every week. And then Memorize it, speak it, quote it, practice using your faith, exercising your faith, practice the law of sowing and reaping. And remember, we said practicing the fruit of the spirit is spiritual exercise. Practice joy. It is a spiritual exercise. Practice patience. It's a spiritual exercise. Practice peace. It is a spiritual exercise. Practice love. It is a spiritual exercise. Practice self-control. Controlling your tongue, controlling your mind, controlling your temper, 
It is a spiritual exercise. Drilling yourself 24 hours a day in spiritual exercises make you skillful and proficient and they form your character, behavior, and performance. It makes you skillful and proficient in godly things, and it forms your character, behavior, and performance. You as an adult need to do it, and you need to teach your children to do it. And this is how you form and develop godly character. Godly character will never come automatically or by itself. It only comes through diligent, disciplining, exercise, practice, and drilling. Amen and amen. And so you need to practice this, practice your self-discipline. So what is self-discipline? Self-discipline is self-rule and self-government, subjecting oneself to rules and proper habits, practices, and behavior. You need to become self-disciplined and you need to teach your children to become self-disciplined. Just like you teach your child when they go to bed, wash your face and brush your teeth. Those are physical habits that they need to learn so that when they grow up, they always brush their teeth. Well, in the same way, you discipline them. Now read your Bible and pray before you go to bed. It becomes a discipline so that when they grow up, they read their Bible and pray. It becomes a practice and it becomes a natural habit and behavior. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And obedience. And we'll be talking more about obedience in the future. But we need to learn to obey God. Your your children need to learn to obey you as a parent. Let me tell you this real quickly. That parents are the first example and representation of God in a child's life. The parent The child does not see God, of course. So the first representation of God in that child's life is the parent. And if it's a bad parent, the child will think God is a bad God because the parent represents God. But if the parent is a good parent and if the parent loves the child, the child will learn to see God loves them. If the parent loves them, the child will see God also loves them because God is their father if they're born again. And then they need to learn to obey their parents. That's why it is so important for parents to discipline their children to obey them. Why? Because that is also disciplining them to obey God. The parent is the representation of God. And if the child does not obey the parent, then the child will not obey God. If the child will not obey their parent, then the child will not obey God because they first learn to obey God by learning to obey their parent. And not only will they not obey God, but if they don't obey their parents, they go to school. They don't obey the teacher. They go out on the streets, they don't obey the police officer, and they become lawbreakers. Lawbreakers come from children who never learned to obey their parents. That's why training and disciplining your child to obey you properly with godly discipline, and I'm not going to go into that, but you need to learn what is godly discipline, and training them to obey you. Why? Because that is also training them to obey God, obey their teachers and obey civil authorities. It is very critical for parents to train their children to obey them always without question. Obedience is required. Why? Because as you grow up, you will learn that you need to also obey God. And there's a lot of adults who don't obey God. They consider obedience to God an option. Well, if I feel like it, I will do this. When God commanded it, God commands us certain things. 
And yet a lot of Christian adults who are Christians, not spiritually adults, but physically adults, and they're Christians, they are not obeying God because they consider God's commandments to be options rather than commands. Well, if I feel like it, I will, or I can't. They just, like I said last week, they believe the lie of the devil. They can't do it, which is simply a deception. The devil's weapon, one of his greatest weapons is deception. And one of his deceptions is that you can't. You can't do what's right. You can't do what you need to do. That's a lie. God said you can. You've got the power of the spirit. You've got the power of the word of God. So you as an adult need to learn obedience to God and to civil authorities. However, we must remember that when civil laws and regulations are contrary to God's laws and commands and instructions to the church, then we must obey God rather than man and the civil authorities. And remember Peter and John in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, when Peter and John had been called before the Sanhedrin, it says in verse 18 and 19, they called them in, that's the Sanhedrin, called them in and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And verse 19 says, but Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. So we are in a day now where we have to even stand up for God's laws and God's commands and not be afraid to stand against civil laws when they are in opposition to God's laws. And you need to teach and train your children to obey God. And therefore, let me just read to you some scriptures real real quickly here. Proverbs thirteen twenty four. he who spares the rod hates his son. It doesn't say you dislike your son. It says you hate your son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline. Proverbs nineteen eighteen. discipline your son for in there in that there is hope. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. folly is bound up in the heart of a child, folly, foolishness, destruction, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Proverbs twenty three thirteen and 14, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will keep that way. Proverbs twenty nine fifteen. discipline your son. He will give you peace. He will bring delight to you. Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen for the word of God is for the for the word of God is all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof that is teaching and rebuking correcting and training in righteousness. God also disciplines us. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm summarizing these verses. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. The Lord disciplines those he loves. And we who have been trained by it, we need to be trained by the Lord's discipline. And then Revelation 3, 19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And here is another repent scripture. And so we should appreciate God's discipline. Job 517 says, blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the almighty. And Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines he, those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. And then Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Now, I didn't say that. The Bible did. He who hates correction is stupid. And then there's many other scriptures. We don't have time to read right now. And so you need to appreciate discipline, correction and rebuke, even when God uses people to give it to you. And like I said before, you know, we hate to receive correction from our family, your spouse, your husband or your wife 
or friends. But you know what? Humility accepts correction and rebuke and says, thank you. I needed that. I will take heed. I will do that. I submit to that. I change. I will change in that area. Humility accepts correction and rebuke. Pride rises up in anger and says, how dare they correct me? Who does she think she is that she should say to me? And then think about what she's done. Well, don't think about what she's done. You need to take a look at yourself. Look in the mirror. Look at yourself. Is what she said true? If it's true, don't pay any attention to her faults. Pay attention to your own and say, yep, you're right. I was wrong. I missed it. I need to change. I'll do better. Amen. And so you need to humbly accept correction and rebuke. This is a sign of uh, of spiritual maturity. It is a huge step in growing up spiritually when you begin to appreciate rebuke. I remember a time in my life when the Lord was showing me things in my life that needed to correct. And I began saying, thank you, Lord, for your rebuke. Thank you for your rebukes. Lord, rebuke me again. And you know what? When you receive rebuke and correction, you will grow and become stronger and you will qualify for the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, I'm out of time. Join me again tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.